Okay, uh, this week we're going to talk about East Asian civilizations uh, around the year 1500 through to around 1700. Um, I'm hoping to be able to load uh, this lecture up on YouTube so uh, you won't have to deal with the loading times. Uh, I did not foresee that. Uh, most people were able to pull up the uh, lecture after a few minutes, but there are some people who uh, it's taking them several hours to uh, download the lectures, and that's just not feasible. Uh, it, it takes about eight hours uh, to convert uh, the PowerPoint into a video and then to upload it onto Blackboard, uh, but uh, with downloading on, a, say, a computer at Lindenwood, it only takes about five minutes. But, uh, you know, every system is different, and I want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for everyone. Uh, so this is going to be... Uh, 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 this is going to be uh, up on YouTube, hopefully. Uh, I also want to remind everyone, you know, if you're... Uh, right now, you know, th this is uh, the first time for many people in an online course. And I understand this. Uh, I'm not going to be a jerk with these deadlines at all. At all. Uh, so, uh, uh, no worries there. Uh, and uh, if you you don't get to a particular lecture uh, by Sunday night, that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm leaving them up. You can go back and post them. Um, and, and you know, that, that will be just fine. Okay, the, de the deadlines are something to aim for so that you don't get behind. Uh, but if something happens or, you know, we have some technical issue, which hopefully uh, in the uh, coming week, week four, uh, you know, I'm getting a new computer shipped in, uh, that should solve a lot of problems, uh, uh, make things much more efficient. Uh, so yeah, uh, don't 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 fret, don't stress. This is I'm I'm trying to make a, you know, I pride myself on making a course that's 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 fun, that's interesting for people who uh, history is not really a, a major or uh, has something they haven't been exposed to a whole lot. So uh, don't worry there. And if you have any questions about anything, please let me know. Also, I should remind you, next week the exam is going to come online, and it's going to be online all week. I'll probably keep it online for two weeks or longer. I'll probably keep it online uh, for longer than that. However, you need to take it next week, if at all possible, <clears throat> and uh, I'll, I'll get that fourth lecture up to you early in the week. I'll have a new computer this time and make that process go smoothly. And you'll be able to watch that lecture uh, and then... Uh, you can take the exam. Now the exam is totally open book. You can watch these lecture videos. You can look at the review sheet I'm going to put up uh, with all the terms and definitions. Uh, you can be on Wikipedia. You can have your phone. You can watch something on TV. What, whatever you want to do. If you're like me and you know you're addicted to Bob's Burgers or something like that, South Park, and you you just can't. Uh, tear yourself away. Uh, you can, you know, it, it's up to you. Now, you'll have about uh, two hours to take the exam. And the issue is that once you sit down to take the exam, you have to finish it in one sitting. You can't take some of it on Tuesday night and then uh, come out Wednesday morning and take the rest of it. That, that's not how Blackboard won't allow you to do that. Uh, so, you need to take it uh, in one sitting. <coughs> You'll get three attempts, and you'll get three attempts to take the test, and the highest grade of the three attempts, your best attempt, is what will go down in the grade book. So it's very feasible for everyone to make a perfect score on this, uh, and you know, I hope that everyone does. And also, if you know your computer blacks out, your power goes off while you're taking the test, just let me know, and I'll restart it and reset it for you, no problems, okay? So there should be no worries there. This should be a uh, 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 stressless you know, uh, 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 ordeal. <clears throat> okay, so now on to the topic. East Asian civilizations, 1400 to 1800. Uh, we're looking at uh, East Asian civilizations at their height. Uh, and by East Asian civilizations, what I'm focusing on uh, are the uh, 
societies shaped by Confucianism, the philosophy of Confucianism, as taught by Confucius and his disciples. Uh, Confucius' name in Chinese and Mandarin is uh, Kung Fu Zhe, and Latinized, uh, as the Europeans uh, in the, the 18th century tended to do, uh, he was Latinized uh, as Confucius, giving him a Roman name. Uh, same thing with his disciple, uh, Meng Zhe, who was Latinized as Mencius. And we're going to use the Roman names in here because they're much easier to remember for an English-speaking audience and to pronounce for an English-speaking audience. Uh, but we're looking primarily at Japan, Korea, China, and Vietnam. These are the societies where the philosophy of Confucius really took root and shaped those societies uh, for centuries. And in this first half, we're going to particularly be looking at China. <clears throat> so at this point, I'd like for you to pause uh, this and watch the first video uh, of the set called, uh, I think it's North Korea slash Western Propaganda. Uh, let me explain this video right quick. Uh, it's vital that you watch this video because uh, everybody loves this video. Uh, uh, they find it fascinating and humorous. Um, but this video was produced by an anthropology professor from North Korea during talks between North Korea and South Korea, uh, North Korea being a communist country, South Korea being an ally of the United States. Uh, he was charged to, uh, uh, under the guise of diplomacy, uh, watch American TV, listen to American music, consume American media uh, for the purposes of preparing a propaganda film. <clears throat> And he made one that it's fascinating because this is, uh, uh, in many ways, North Korea. While it's technically a communist country, uh, that's it's a communist country in name. Uh, it's basically kind of a, a, a divine monarchy with Kim Jong Un, his father Kim Jong Il, his father Kim Il Sung, basically ruling kind of as god kings, like sort of on the model of uh, traditional emperors in Confucian society. <clears throat> so, uh, just take a look at how uh, uh, the society uh, perceives American society, and then uh, come back to uh, the lecture. Okay, so, uh, watching that video, uh, you can see that American celebrities, Madonna, uh, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, uh, Paris Hilton, Tyra Banks, uh, Michael Jackson, <coughs> they, they stand out because they're very individualistic. And, and the culture in the United States is very individualistic. But what we might call individualistic, in this part of the world, that's narcissistic. You know, that, that, that uh, these people are narcissists. That's what the, the, the uh, anthropologist, uh, anthropology professor keeps stating. They're narcissists. They have narcissistic personality disorder, right? Uh, so they're dysfunctional. Uh, and you know, this idea of self-glorification, of you doing what you're going to do no matter what, no matter what anyone else thinks of it, this is the antithesis of uh, uh, these societies which are collectivist, where the individual is part of a greater group, uh, and loyalty to the, to the group is greater than loyalty to the individual. <clears throat> For example, in our society, our constitution uh, was developed to protect the individual from the group. Uh, and Confucianism, it's the idea is to protect the group from the individual. So just keep that in mind as we go through this lecture. Okay, to talk about uh, the philosophy in the East, we have to talk about the philosophy in the West so we can make a contrast. In Europe in 1500, the dominant ideology was, was a, a philosophical system derived from Christianity. So at the very top uh, of all of existence, the universe of this hierarchy, uh, we have God. God created the world. He created humanity. He created uh, morality. He created good. He decided what was good, what was evil, uh, what was uh, righteous, what was wicked. <coughs> and so the entire universe was ordered by God. It was put into order by God. And Europeans in the 1500s called this the great chain of being. 
So you can see at the top of this illustration you have God. Uh, he's surrounded by the archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, the very powerful angels. Below them are the seraphim, the less powerful angels. Below them are human beings, and you notice that they're all on the same tier. That's because human beings are equal in dignity. However, uh, the, and towards the center of the uh, picture, you can see the kings and bishops, those people chosen by God to lead other people, to lead other people towards salvation. <coughs> and below humanity, you have birds, a sacred animal to, to Europeans in this period because the uh, Holy Spirit descended as a dove on Christ after he was baptized by John the Baptist. Below that, you have sea creatures, then terrestrial animals, then plants, and then at the very bottom, you have the devil. Okay, and, and you can see on the right, the far right, the falling angels falling into hell uh, to become demons. <coughs> this is how, how European Christians in 1500 perceived the universe. Now, Christian Europeans in the 1500s believed that God had created natural laws laws of nature. Uh, Isaac Newton, when he's uncovering the laws of motion, he sees himself as uncovering God's natural law, the natural laws that God put into the universe that we discern through reason. So when we look for truth in a Western sense, we're going to look outside of ourselves. We're going to look at the external world and we're going to look for uh, uh, God's footprints to see what the truth is, to use our reason, to test reality, uh, to uh, the whole scientific method coming out of this process. <clears throat> this is very, very different from uh, the Confucian way of coming at the truth. So right now I would like for you to uh, uh, pause the lecture, watch the second video, uh, the one uh, on filial piety. So just go ahead and watch this uh, uh, video. <coughs> okay, so uh, watching that video, you can see that the, the, the uh, family is a very, very critical uh, uh, element in the society and this way of thinking. And I included this video because I think it's the perfect example of a Confucian ideology. I mean, it's got that quote by Confucius in there. How one generation loves, the next generation learns. <coughs> in Confucianism, we don't look outside of ourselves for truth. We don't look to uh, uh, testing the laws of nature. We don't look to, have it, to conduct experiments. <coughs> because we're not looking for... Uh, uh, natural laws as created by God. Now, what we what we want to do to derive truth is we want to uh, look at human relationships. We derive our truth from studying human beings and how human beings behave and act. And the most critical element of that is the family. We derive the truth by studying the family. The family is the core of truth. It's the core of society. It's the core of life in this philosophical system. <clears throat> you can see also this cat here. This is uh, this was painted around the year 800 in the Dong Dynasty. Uh, this cat has a combination of light and dark fur. Light on the bottom with this upside down V shape on the top of the head. Uh, dark colored fur and with a dark colored uh, spot on its leg. So this was painted in the year 800. We fast forward to a painting of a cat in the uh, 1930s uh, and you know this is over a thousand years later <coughs> and you can see the upside down v-shape on the cat's head, the dark colored fur on the back, the light colored fur on the bottom, uh, the spot on the leg and the dark colored tail. And the reason for this uh, is that uh, this, uh, it's not necessarily for you to know the specifics about this, but this harkens to a philosophy called Taoism. If you've ever seen what's called a yin-yang, 
uh, the uh, black and white symbol of Taoism. Uh, uh, that's what this cat is based off of. <coughs> that's the coloration of the cat. Uh, that's, that's what it's uh, supposed to imply. Uh, harmonious balance of yin and yang. Now, th that, that in and of itself is not really important. What's important is that uh, this society, uh, the value system is very conservative. Right? It looks towards the past for truth. Uh, in the West, we tend to talk about progress, right? being progressive. Uh, we, we work for the future. We envision a future in which you know people are flying around, buying cars, and you know uh, uh, all kinds of science fiction. You know, uh, in this Confucian mindset, you look to the past. You look to your ancestors for truth, and that bears out in these paintings. <coughs> Confucius or Kung Fu Zhe was born during a period called the Warring States period. So this is a period in Chinese history. Uh, he's, he's living around the same time as uh, Socrates in Greece, uh, a little bit uh, before. Uh, but uh, uh, with uh, uh, Confucius, uh, he's living in the Warring States period. And this is an era in which there are at first dozens of small independent states later uh, about a dozen uh, major states that eventually break down into five or six and then one conquers the rest of them. Uh, but it's a period of severe civil war, civil strife. Uh, it's in this period that the crossbow is introduced to the battlefield. The Chinese inventing, inventing the crossbow, they possessed it earlier than many other peoples. Uh, and it's a very lethal weapon. So we're looking at armies of hundreds of thousands of soldiers uh, killing each other in these bloody contests, villages where uh, entire generations are lost to this fighting. So Confucius walked around this society and he, he visited different cities and he was concerned with the truth. He asked himself, well, why are we fighting like this? Why are we killing each other? Why are these young men killing each other uh, at such a, a, a near genocidal rate? You know, why, why is there all of this destruction? around us. Uh, uh, and he, he, he came to the conclusion that uh, uh, it was the relationship that people have with their parents. Uh, the family life is what determined the civil life, determined the structure of society, determined whether there would be war or peace, determined whether society would become wealthy or poor. It all depended on whether or not families were strong in these states, whether the rulers fostered strong families or whether they harmed the family. <clears throat> and in particular, you know, before Western psychology, sociology, any of that was invented. Any of that, any of that was, was a thought in anyone's mind. Over uh, you know, 2,000 years before this, uh, he recognized uh, that a human being's relationship with his or her mother and father these are the most critical elements in determining how that person will, uh, who that person will be in life. <clears throat> Confucius uh, had a disciple. Uh, he he uh, wasn't living while Confucius was living, but he was a disciple nonetheless. Uh, his name was Mencius or Mengzu, Master Meng. Uh, and he, he, the analogy I use is in Christianity you have Christ and then you have the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a thinker. He's a, a very deep thinker. He's a philosopher. He takes the Gospels and he synthesizes them into something that is very presentable, that's a, breaking down these very complex principles in a way that's understandable uh, by many people. And Mengzi kind of did this with the teachings of Confucius. He developed it into a philosophy that could be more easily digested. Uh, and he, in particular, he created a, a, an interpretation of the works of Confucius that the state could use uh, to benefit society at large. <coughs> During the Han Dynasty, deep in antiquity, 206 BCE to 220 CE, or BC and AD, depending on your preferred uh, dating system, Confucianism became the official philosophy of the Chinese imperial government. It would remain the official philosophy of the Chinese imperial government until 1912, a 
Okay, so for over 2,000 years, this philosophy governed this society. <clears throat> and what Confucians want to develop is something called humaneness. And it's not really, it can't really be easily translated into English. We use the term humaneness because that's the closest we can come to it. Uh, the, the Mandarin word for it is run. And uh, humaneness is a combination of learning, proper conduct. Uh, in, in this society, learning isn't just something you do so that you can become more moral. By learning, it, it, or it isn't just something you can do so you have knowledge so you can be more moral. Learning itself, the act of learning, makes you more moral. And so this is a society that values education very, very, very highly. Okay, the, the act of learning uh, in and of itself improves who you are, makes you a better person. The second element is functional social relationships. We need to have strong relationships with our fathers and mothers. We need to be obedient to them, to be obedient sons and daughters. We need functional relationships with our spouses. We need functional relationships with our children. We need functional relationships as subjects as rulers and you know we need to be conscious of our roles and know what is appropriate for our roles and uh, try to understand our, our limits when you know looking at uh, uh, other people's roles uh, this is a very traditional way of looking at the world <clears throat> uh, in the family men and women have very different spheres uh, and both are valued uh, but both function differently uh, Confucius believing that each spouse must play to his or her strengths uh, to make the family as a whole stronger. And finally, uh, well, not finally, uh, the third element is service to the state. So we're not going to just use our education and our social status to, um, to amass wealth, amass pro a private fortune. Uh, the goal is to serve the government and thus to give back to society at large. Okay, we want to uh, work for the collective. This is a collectivist mentality, a collectivist society. And it's very different from the kind of rugged individualism we tend to value in the United States, that the United States culture is kind of based on. <clears throat> and finally, uh, concern for the common people. So uh, if you're a member of the nobility or you're an educated person, uh, you have to cultivate compassion and empathy for the farming peasants, basically. Uh, you have to look out for them. Confucius taught that uh, 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 all of civilization depended on them, depended upon the farmers, first and foremost. So taking care of them was essential. <clears throat> the social structure in a Confucian society uh, is based on the family. Society is basically a large family super family, if you will. So each individual in the government correlates to a role within the family. So the emperor is the father of the people. He has to provide for the people. He has to care for the people. He has to ensure that they're safe. He has to guide them. And most importantly, he has to set a moral example for them so that they, uh, because as Confucius stated that uh, children will always imitate their father uh, in early life. Uh, the people will always imitate the emperor. Uh, so the emperor must be moral. He must be a good man. He must be virtuous. He must care for the people, provide for them, take care of them when their crops fail, protect them from step nomads that tend to break through the Great Wall and kill people and drag people off to slavery. <clears throat> and he does this with the help of officials who are referred to as uncles and great uncles. Okay, so these are the uncles and great uncles of the people. They don't have the primal role of the father, but they're still elders who have to be obeyed. <clears throat> the agricultural peasants are dutiful children, uh, and they have to obey their elders. They have to obey their father. They enjoy the protection of their father. They're not slaves. He can't do whatever he wants with them. He has to be good to them. He has to care for them as his children but they also have to obey because he knows what's best for them. That's how this system works. So a proper social hierarchy re reflects a pro properly ordered family where you have a nurturing mother, you have a, a, a virtuous 
uh, 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 father in a leadership role, and you have the children who obey their mother and father, with the uncles, aunts, great uncles, etc., great uh, aunts, uh, playing a support role uh, in an extended family context. <coughs> now, the virtue uh, that was displayed in the video uh, that you, you guys watched with the uh, man, his son, and his mother, this virtue is called filial piety, and it means being pious towards one's parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, basically venerating your elders. Okay, So this is the most important Confucian ethic. Uh, officials are often recruited and promoted based on how they revered their parents. Okay? So you have to take care of your parents. In fact, there's, there's a uh, manual on marriage uh, written uh, around the time we're covering, around 1500, uh, 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 maybe a little bit earlier, in which one of the most famous female writers of the age gives instructions on how to care for uh, her husband's parents and her parents, uh, and that's to make sure that they're warm, that they're well fed, that they're, when they're sick they have medicine. This is the highest virtue, and so, and this is because each generation has a debt to the generation that came before, and that that video highlighted that perfectly. Uh, that man had to care for his mother in her cranky old age because uh, she had sacrificed so much for him uh, during a very dark period of Chinese history. Uh, so, and, and he passed this value on to his son, care for, for your elders, respect for tradition and for your ancestors. This is why people in these societies will burn incense uh, and, and say prayers for their ancestors at family altars and graves. Uh, <clears throat> and, and just as an aside, uh, you know, I, I, I've uh, uh, had some experience in Japan. Uh, one of the questions that people will ask is, why do Americans have nursing homes? This, this concept of a nursing home, this is for people who don't have any living relatives. They, they do have nursing homes, but uh, this is not something that people people uh, will, are willing to, to participate in. They see this as horrific. Uh, the idea of throwing uh, your elders into homes like this. This is something that they see as barbaric and immoral. And this is because they are, uh, th these values are inculcated from a very early age of reverence for one's parents, grandparents, etc. So the ideal society was composed of five social classes. The imperial family, family of the father, scholar officials, the peasants. Below the peasants you have the artisans who were blacksmiths and other craftsmen. And at the very bottom you had the merchants. This is not a business friendly society. Confucius considered the merchants parasites because they took what the artisans and peasants produced and they basically just moved it around for profit. So they were parasites who preyed off of the wealth produced by the productive classes. Uh, so he was very, very hostile to merchants. The role of the emperors. The emperor was not only a father, he was also a son. He was the son of heaven. Now heaven is kind of a supernatural entity in Confucianism, but it's not like a god. It's not, uh, it's not uh, conscious. Right? It's not self-aware. It's kind of like the laws of nature, uh, but there's no it has no. It has a will, but it's not. It doesn't have a, a mind. It doesn't have a consciousness. Uh, so, uh, uh, heaven bestows a mandate on the emperor when he's virtuous. Right? He has the right to rule. He has a mandate to rule. If you're a good emperor and you act according to the dictates of heaven, right? You act according to uh, uh, nature and you do the right thing. Uh, you don't. Uh, you don't engage in immorality. Uh, you will have a successful reign according to this system. You will have peace, prosperity, the people will work hard on their crops, uh, you will not have droughts, you will not have epidemic diseases, the barbarians to the north will not be able to break the Great Wall, uh, you'll have peace, prosperity, etc. In Confucianism, these emperors don't strive to rule by rule of law, like in the West, where uh, there's a social problem, 
and then a law is produced, whether by a legislature in a democratic society or in an absolute monarchy by the dictate of the emperor with his cabinet, etc. Uh, laws are not issued uh, as to, uh, uh, to guide people. The emperor guides the people by his own personal example. Uh, it's kind of like and it is, it's sim it's, Confucius argued that, you know, do as I say, not as I do, that this is basically what the rule of law was, that the elite telling the people to obey this law, uh, even if they themselves were breaking the law. And, and he argued that that will always lead to disaster. What you want to do is you want to rule by example, and, uh, do as I do. And if the emperor was virtuous, the people, according to Confucius, would naturally want to imitate their emperor, so they would become virtuous themselves. However, if the emperor was inattentive, if he exploited the people, if he was engaged in drunkenness, if he spent all of his time with his concubines in the palace, eating luxurious foods, never caring for the government, allowing the people to suffer from diseases, warfare, drought, famine, etc., uh, uh, that was a sign that heaven had abandoned him and he would lose the mandate of heaven, and heaven would bestow that on another individual who would then be able to overthrow the emperor and set up a new dynasty. <clears throat> the emperor, though he was an absolute ruler, he couldn't control this massive empire solely by himself. He had to have help. And his help came in the form of the scholar gentry. The scholar gentry were... Uh, intellectual elites who uh, were very intelligent, they were well educated in the Confucian classics, those works written by Confucius, his disciples, and those later scholars in that tradition. So they were educated in the dominant morality, the Confucian morality, care for your elders, care for the people, uh, etc. Uh, so these people were recruited to help the emperor run the administration and govern the provinces. I'd like for you to just take a second and watch the third video uh, uh, there. I think it's uh, labeled Yuge Liang slash uh, uh, Bay. Uh, just watch this uh, video and uh, take a look at what's being valued there. Okay, so this video uh, is about the ideal scholar, Yuge Liang. He serves the Emperor Liu Bei, who comes to visit him. Uh, he bows down to him and he agrees to leave uh, his uh, uh, reclusive home to go with Liu Bei to save the people, save the Han Dynasty. Uh, and he's a brilliant man. He's a strategist who cannot be defeated. Uh, he invents agricultural products. You can see him with the peasant with the water wheel uh, 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 helping feed the people. Uh, he's very virtuous, very intelligent. Uh, th this is the this is the scholar gentry. This this is the uh, administrative class of the empire, and it's unlike in Europe, or say southwestern Asia, Islamic societies, where you have an aristocracy, uh, a military aristocracy that will rule society. Uh, this is a bureaucratic aristocracy of scholars, and it's very effective. You know, this is a, this has been the most populous nation in the world uh, throughout most of history. Even in this era, uh, there were millions of people living in a society. It was able to maintain these large populations, this system, uh, and these scholar, uh, gen these scholar bureaucrats were able to oversee giant construction projects like the Grand Canal, the Great Wall, etc. And, and just take a look at the Grand Canal. It links the Yellow River with the Yangtze River in southern China, so north and southern China. Two great liver rivers are linked. <coughs> And this is uh, the largest artificial canal, in the, uh, largest canal in the world. About an artificial canal, uh, and it's still in use. In fact, uh, many of the goods that we all possess, due to the prevalence of, of goods being produced in China, uh, have traveled along this canal. And it's a testament to how effective this system was, how effective these scholar gentry were as leaders. The scholar gentry were recruited after passing exams. This is the first uh, examination system in history. The uh, 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 Han Dynasty is the first to establish a university. 
uh, in the second century uh, AD uh, from which to train and recruit scholars. Uh, with this system, a uh, scholar would enter one of these cells you see here, and they would stay in there for a, a series of three days. They would have servants to bring them food, bring them writing materials, etc. And all three days, they would basically answer essay questions uh, about morality. You know, if, uh, for example, if uh, there's famine in the village and you can only feed the old or the young, you know, what, what are you going to do there? Right? And, and, and you have to interpret this in a Confucian fashion. Uh, and if you do well, if you score very high on the exam, you are appointed to a very high post in government. Uh, in fact, the, the number one candidate will get to choose uh, his office. Uh, <clears throat> if you score very low on the exam, uh, you will be put into a pro post in the provinces, out in the countryside, uh, etc. If we want to talk about Imperial China, we have to talk about eunuchs. Eunuchs are castrated male servants. It was very common for peasants out in the countryside who had one too many mouths to feed in their households uh, to have their sons castrated by special surgeons skilled in removing the testicles uh, and sending them to wealthy households, uh, to wealthy uh, people throughout the nation uh, but especially the imperial palace and the capital uh, to be eunuchs and to, to be servants. Now, the reason for this is that these emperors and wealthy men have large numbers of women uh, in their households. You, know, uh, you might have a wealthy scholar who might have four wives and two concubines. Well, with the emperors, he might have uh, uh, four wives and 200 concubines or sometimes even 800 concubines, right? Uh, and it's very critical that the emperors are the fathers of the children who inherit the throne, that they have his blood. If they don't have his blood, then this, the dynasty will lose the mandate of heaven and there will be civil strife and destruction throughout society. So we have to make sure that there's no cuckolding going on in the imperial palace, that the, that the emperor is able to be, is the true father of the children who are born to the concubines and wives. So the men who are inside the palace grounds are all castrated. Right? It's similar to what we looked at in the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, many slaves taken from West Africa castrated to serve as eunuchs uh, as harem guards. <clears throat> so these emperors are, these eunuchs are serving the emperor's basic everyday needs. They're feeding him, all of his cooks are eunuchs. Uh, they're clothing him, all of his tailors are eunuchs. They're serving his basic uh, commands. Uh, they're giving him medicine. They're, they're seeing to every facet of his life. And if you, if you keep in mind that some of these emperors would inherit the throne at four or five years of age, these eunuchs could gain tremendous influence. They could basically, in some instances where they were weak emperors, they could control these emperors and dictate to them uh, what, they, what they wanted to have happen. And in many instances, these eunuchs were corrupt. Uh, many of them didn't have administrative experience, uh, and they often fought with the scholar officials, uh, and they could bring great destruction throughout society. Uh, uh, and, and many dynasties uh, fell because of the eunuchs taking power. Also, there are hundreds of women in these palaces. In this society, legally speaking, you have patrilineal descent. That means that children are legally only the members of the father's family. Now, they understood biological reproduction, that children were the children of both the father and the mother. Uh, but uh, legally speaking, uh, women belonged to the, the household of their brothers and fathers throughout their lives. So these empresses and concubines, when they were taken into the imperial palace, uh, many of them sought to have their brothers, fathers, grandfathers, cousins, etc., put into high positions in government, high offices. Uh, and many of these empresses schemed against one another. Uh, many of them uh, had uh, each other murdered due to the fact that, you know, if one empress was pregnant or one concubine was pregnant, 
uh, and another empress or concubine was was not pregnant and uh, wanted to become pregnant, uh, uh, they could have the, each other murdered. Uh, and there are many instances of empresses being uh, uh, deposed or executed. For example, during the reign of Emperor Ling at the end of the Han Dynasty, uh, there was an empress, Empress Sung. Uh, she, uh, another empress, basically accused her of witchcraft, uh, of, of engaging in black magic to try to poison the emperor. Uh, and this was done because uh, she was seen as a threat due to her fertility, uh, due to her age, uh, and uh, uh, she, was, she was eventually destroyed by this. Uh, she was exiled to the provinces and ended up committing suicide. Okay, so uh, in many instances, and, and keep in mind that if, a, if an empress is the empress to uh, an emperor, and then he dies, and in this society, like in most societies, women outlive men by sometimes even a significant margin, especially in antiquity. Her child will become emperor. And, you know, this is, this new emperor, this empress is his mother. And the term for the emperor's mother is the empress dowager. These empress dowagers uh, in a Confucian society, they could exert tremendous influence over the emperors. So in many instances, the empress dowagers were actually the ones running society, running the kingdom, uh, using their sons or cousins or nephews or whatever as puppets. Uh, in many instances, it would be the empress dowagers who would choose uh, who would succeed to the throne if one of their sons died, uh, etc. And many of these empresses would often form factions and feud with the eunuchs and with the scholar gentry. Right? You have three major factions in court, the empresses, the eunuchs, and the scholar gentry. <clears throat> and I'll tell the story of Emperor Wu. Uh, his birth name uh, was Sima Yan. Uh, he was very lustful. He had about 2,000 women total uh, in his palace. Uh, he had created a whole, basically a small city to house them. And they all had their houses together, and there were restaurants that sprung up just to service them. Uh, there were physicians that sprung up just to service them, all sorts of business uh, organized around these very wealthy women. Uh, but to, he, he, didn't, he couldn't remember all of their names. Obviously, there's 2,000 of them. So uh, he created kind of a, a, a very, I guess, unique way of uh, deciding who to spend the night with each night. He created a chariot uh, driven by goats. It was pulled by goats. And wherever that chariot, wherever those goats stopped, the nearest house, uh, he would stay with the woman in that house. So uh, some very crafty uh, empresses, the empress of the, the next emperor, she figured out how to plant certain types of grass. Uh, she would leave rice out uh, on her doorstep, and of course the goats would stop there. Uh, and this emperor was so dim-witted, he never caught on to what she was doing, and she ended up mothering the next emperor. Okay, the major, the, the largest danger that this society faced was that of steppe nomads. These uh, horse nomads, are right, they're expert horsemen living out in the desert, in the grasslands, living in these tough regions, expert soldiers. And just to give an example, okay, we have the map of the Mongol Empire, the largest of these steppe nomad empires in history. There were many. Uh, the Huns, for example, were steppe nomads. The Turks were steppe nomads originally. Uh, and the Mongols. Over here on the left, you see an image of the destruction of Baghdad by the Mongols. The Mongols totally destroyed uh, what's now Iraq and Iran. They destroyed Baghdad. Baghdad was one of the most magnificent cities, most sophisticated cities in the world at the time. Uh, and if you notice, when you look in uh, 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 kind of an eighth grade social studies book, you'll see that civilization started in Iraq. It started in the Fertile Crescent, and the land between the two rivers. Uh, and this is because that land was very fertile. Uh, Iraq and Iran, called Persia uh, in Mesopotamia in antiquity, these, this is where agriculture started. This is where uh, Iran is where the goat, the sheep were domesticated. When the Mongols attacked, they killed so many farmers, they destroyed the irrigation system so thoroughly 
plowed salt into fields, destroyed the natural environment so utterly that these regions have yet to recover. Even in modern times, they have not returned to their previous state of being agriculturally well. And which is why we, when we think of Iraq and Iran, we tend to think of a lot of desertification, it's very arid, etc. This, this is because of this. So the Chinese sought to keep these people out of their empire at all costs because they could break through and slaughter millions, and they did. So throughout the centuries, one of the uh, main lines of defense, uh, the most important line of defense, was the Great Wall. The Great Wall was designed to keep these steppe nomads out of China at all costs. It was built before the uh, Han Dynasty. It was started before the Han Dynasty by the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang Di. Uh, you won't no reason to remember that. Um, but, you know, it's the longest man-made structure on Earth. You have hundreds of thousands of workers conscripted throughout the empire to build it, and, and in subsequent centuries, the same thing. More than a million workers have died building this Great Wall and extending it uh, throughout China. They say that for, the legend is that for every meter of the Great Wall, someone lost his or her life. Uh, and this human toll is extreme, but it demonstrates uh, how serious the uh, Chinese government was about keeping people out, keeping these steppe nomads out of the country. All right, now on to some specific history. The Ming Dynasty. The name of the Ming means brilliant. That's a test question, so you remember that. Uh, the Ming Dynasty was founded by the Emperor Hun Wu. And the Emperor Hun Wu uh, was born a peasant. Uh, he learned to read in his 20s. Uh, he became a Buddhist monk. Uh, and then after that, he, uh, uh, during a period of rebellion against the Mongols who had conquered China, uh, he became the leader of a group of rebels. Uh, he managed to overthrow the Mongols to drive them back beyond the Great Wall. He set up a new dynasty. So he came from, like the founder of the Han Dynasty, he was a peasant who rose to the top. Uh, and throughout the rest of the, his descendants' rule, the Ming Dynasty, the Chinese strove to keep the steppe barbarians from spilling into their borders. This is critical because uh, about 100 years, well, 70 years or so, before Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus and all of these guys sailing from Spain and Portugal are uh, making these voyages of discovery, uh, the first great explorer of the world's oceans was a Chinese uh, eunuch named Zheng Ha. Zheng Ha led seven voyages uh, across the Indian Ocean as far afield as East Africa. And so he's sailing all the way from Eastern Asia, from China, all the way to East Africa. Uh, and these voyages demonstrate that, that Chinese technology was very advanced, naval technology was very advanced, the compass, uh, a type of ship called a junk uh, that was very capable, uh, still in use today to ship modern goods, uh, the traditional design. Uh, and, you know, this, they were more than capable of mass exploration of the globe. The problem was that when Zheng He would arrive in these ports in India, the Middle East, Africa, uh, he didn't encounter goods that he wanted. And so when he came back to the emperor, he said, well, this is what we found in this part of India. This is what we found in this part of Persia. This is what we found in this part of Ethiopia. Uh, the emperor said, well, we already can produce all of this. You know, we already have this in China uh, in abundance. Uh, so there was not, uh, these voyages were not a source of profit like they were for the Portuguese. Uh, so, uh, this deterred exploration. And the only benefits that Zheng He brought back to the emperor were oddities, like this giraffe here that he presented to the emperor that was given to him in East Africa. <clears throat> to make matters worse for Zheng He, uh, the Mongols, the steppe nomads, uh, became strong again. They reunified and they threatened uh, the Ming. Uh, they threatened to break through the Great Wall again and conquer China. So the emperor decided to divert the funds from uh, these voyages of exploration uh, to defense against the steppe nomads. He saw that as much more practical 
then sailing around, uh, arriving in regions that, that didn't have anything the Chinese wanted. Now, of course, 70 years after this, the Portuguese begin sailing around the world. They sail around the southern tip of Africa. Uh, eventually, North and South America are discovered as part of this process. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the great what-ifs in history, if not the greatest what-if in history. You know, what would have happened if these voyages had been patronized by the, the Chinese emperors, if they had funded these, if they had supported this? Uh, we might be living in a very different world now with uh, China settling North and South America. <coughs> Eventually, the Ming declined for reasons that uh, many Chinese dynasties declined. Eunuch influence. Eunuchs end up running the government as the emperors become inattentive. Uh, there was one emperor towards the end of the Ming uh, who spent his entire reign inebriated. Uh, uh, there was one Ming emperor who would carouse in the city in brothels with prostitutes, even though he had hundreds of concubines in the imperial palace. Uh, it, he had this thrill of participating in, in, in brothels and, and uh, it, this uh, destroyed the prestige of the ruling dynasty. Uh, on top of that, uh, there was a war with Japan over control of Korea and uh, the Ming won, uh, but at tremendous cost. The Japanese were much more skilled uh, militarily uh, and it was only through sheer numbers and sacrifice of hundreds of thousands of soldiers that the Ming were able to keep the Japanese conquering Korea. Uh, and Japanese pirates hampered the coast. And what the Ming policy was to, to do, and this was a thought, uh, plan thought up by eunuchs, uh, to give you an idea of just how destructive they could be. What the Japan, what the eunuchs policy was, uh, was to uh, depopulate the coastal regions. So for, you know, 25 miles from the coast, the entire population was moved inland. Uh, now imagine if uh, we try to do this in our society. We try to move New York City 25 miles to the west. We try to move, move um, Boston 25 miles to the west. Right? We try to move uh, Miami right, 25 miles uh, to the north. Uh, uh, this would be catastrophic, and it was. People revolted against this, uh, and the government eventually had to abandon this plan. <clears throat> Finally, out of frustration, uh, the Ming ended up shutting their country off from outside influence. And this was very, very destructive because this is a period in which all of these advancements begin to gain momentum and, and, and science and technology develop exponentially. Uh, in Europe, uh, 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 science, technology, philosophy begins to develop at a very rapid pace and the Ming don't share in any of this. So by the 19th century, uh, the British are able to defeat the uh, Chinese very handily, even though uh, they're, they're totally outnumbered. Uh, and this is because of the difference in technology uh, due to this culture of isolation. And eventually, a group of steppe nomads rose up uh, who were powerful enough to take the empire. What happened was the last Ming emperor faced a rebellion. The people got sick of the corrupt rule. They were starving. Uh, the security situation was in shambles, so they revolted. And rather than lose to this revolt, uh, the last Ming emperor called in these steppe nomads. This is seen as the ultimate act of treason. He called in this group of foreigners to come and crush his own people's rebellion. So uh, what happened was uh, this, the, the Manchus, this ethnic group of, of nomads to the north, they, they, they came in, they crushed the rebellion, and of course they, their military power who crushed the rebellion and pacified the land, uh, the Manchu leader, Nurhachi, said, well, hey, we, we did all your dirty work, we might as well just take over. Uh, so uh, they did take over and they established the Qing dynasty. This is the last Chinese dynasty, and the name means pure. And the dynasty was initially foreign. It was ruled by Manchus, not Han Chinese. Uh, but the Qing actually attempted to restore the traditional values, the examination system, which had become corrupt during the last few Ming emperors. So they actually, even though they were foreigners, they became 
uh, as Chinese as possible over time. And this is something that happens throughout Chinese history. Step nomads will in enter China militarily through conquest, and then over time they will become Chinese culturally themselves. And the Manchus instated something called the banner system. And this is important because this is a system of racial segregation uh, very early in history. Uh, what this means is that uh, banners uh, were a banner, a flag, was assigned to each ethnic group in the empire. You can see a Manchu banner symbol here. Right? Uh, there are multiple uh, banners within these ethnic groups to signify different clans, etc. Uh, but the banner system was designed to privilege the Manchus and other nomadic groups over the Han Chinese. The Han Chinese, uh, the natives, had to uh, wear their hair in what's called the Q, the Q haircut. It's this long, uh, single braid running down the back. And this was done to distinguish the Han Chinese from the Manchu. Uh, the, over time, uh, the Manchu themselves began to adopt this haircut, and even though it was a system of it was a sign of subjection, of being conquered, uh, it became such a, a normal part of the culture, it became internalized that you can see this man here on the right, he is living in the 1880s in San Francisco, uh, yet he still wears his hair in this fashion because this is the only, this is how he feels comfortable. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, this will end the section on China. Uh, I'm looking to uh, put up this section on Japan also, uh, that will go much faster. Uh, so be sure to check that out as well. And let me know if you have any questions whatsoever.